Welcome to RCR Wireless News. I'm Martha DeGrasse, and this is the Outdoor DAS and Small Cells Case Studies. I'd like to introduce you to your panelists for today. Jacob Hamilton is Director of Engineering at Verizon Wireless for Northern California. Jake, thank you so much for joining us today. Glad to be here, Martha. Thanks. Joe Madden is founder of Mobile Experts. Joe, thank you very much for joining our webinar. Yes, hi, Martha. Thank you for having me. Ken Sanfeld is here representing one of our sponsors, Solid. He is president of Solid Americas. Welcome, Ken. Hey, thank you very much. And we have Todd Landry from JMA Wireless. Todd, thank you very much for being here today, representing JMA Wireless, also one of our sponsors. Hey, thanks, Martha. Pleasure to be here. And I'm Martha DeGrasse with RCR Wireless News. A quick word about RCR Wireless News. We are a premier news source covering carrier, network, device, test and measurement, telecom software, and IoT news. Find us at rcrwireless.com and at our newest website, industrialiot5g.com. Follow us on Twitter at RCR Wireless News. My Twitter is rcr And find RCR TV on YouTube. We have more than 6,000 videos on our YouTube channel. Now, at this time, I'd like to call your attention to the case studies feature report that published today on our website. You can find that by clicking on the reports tab on the RCR wireless website. It's also on our homepage. We outlined six case studies there, two of which we're gonna go into more in depth on this webinar. A quick overview of those case studies. One of them is a citywide network in Atlanta that started out as more of a neighborhood DAS and is now migrating to remote radio units paired with antennas on poles it is a single carrier system currently, but a second carrier is preparing to join, and eventually both carriers will use a CRAN architecture. CRAN architecture is also used in the Verizon's San Francisco deployment, and Jake's gonna tell us a lot more about that today. This report also covers a multi-carrier DAS in Maryland that was built originally by New Path Networks for Sprint, and then when Crown Castle acquired New Path, Crown expanded it to a three carrier system for Verizon, AT&T, and Sprint. So that was a really interesting case study. We also have the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Uh, Todd is here from JMA Wireless to tell us a lot more about that in this webinar because they were the vendor there. We also have a case study out of Switzerland, which is um, really sort of unique, I think, in that the antennas are actually underground. And that seems a little counterintuitive, but for this particular Swisscom deployment, it really served the carrier's need for, for capacity in a dense area and it helped them leverage underground conduit that they already had, so it kept their costs down. And finally, we have uh, the Berlin Fan Mile, which was Vodafone and Telefonica, uh, obviously in Berlin. And uh, that was a digital DAS deployment, which uh, used uh, remote units that digitized the signal and cut down on the fire, fire requirements by doing that. So we hope you'll check out the feature report. Now, at this time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Joe Madden for our analyst angle introduction. Joe? Okay, thank you, Martha. And what I thought I'd do today to set the stage for the discussion is to, first of all, talk about a little bit of historical perspective on, on this outdoor market. And I've been involved with uh, base stations and macro deployment for, for almost 20 years now. So, uh, you know, I've, I've sort of seen the days of, of 30 watt uh, transmitters for single carrier amplifiers. And we uh, actually, Ken Sanfeld and I worked together in, in doing some of these high power multi carrier amplifiers in the early 2000s. And uh, what's happening in, in the last 15 years is that the power level has really been coming down. We've, we've uh, fully uh, adopted the multi-carrier power amplifier technology, uh, but now those big, the big tower and power paradigm is, is over. And, uh, and so I think uh, what operators are focusing on more and more these days is capacity as opposed to coverage. Uh, so instead of 160 watts from a transmitter, uh, we're doing something like LTE with two by five watt transmitters for two by two MIMO. Um, so uh, the, the general trend is for radio power to come down, the antenna height is coming down, and capacity is going way up. Um, so uh, that's uh, just kind of the general trend. Uh, if we go to the next slide then, Martha, um, well, what I'd like to talk about is, is how we're modeling this today and, and trying to look around at the market. Um, what we've noticed is that uh, every network has a different level of traffic density. And we measure this traffic density in terms of gigabits per second per square kilometer 
per megahertz of spectrum. Um, so again, if you if you think about that, that has to do with the amount of data being transmitted uh, for every square kilometer and in every megahertz of spectrum. It's it's a way of looking at traffic density. And uh, some of the most dense networks in the world, for example, in Tokyo and Seoul, uh, have uh, GCAM figures that, that, that peak in the range of, you know, sort of like one gigabit per square kilometer per megahertz uh, in, in the peak area at the peak time of the day. Um, what we see here is some of the some of the average numbers for these cities, and and when we see that average figure, uh, for example, in New York, San Francisco last year uh, reached a level of about 0 0.02 GKM. Uh, that's that's a threshold point where we've we've noticed that's where uh, when we reach that threshold level of density in to in Tokyo and Seoul, uh, they started to deploy small cells uh, in the outdoor network there. And uh, it's exactly the same in the United States right now. We've we've reached that threshold, and we see these cloud round deployments uh, with Verizon and AT and T and some of the urban centers there. Uh, so, so we use that as a as a way of modeling different cities around the world and coming up with our forecasts uh, for just just how quickly will these small cell deployments ramp up. Um, one last thing to cover before we jump into the discussion, just some of the terminology. I think uh, many people get confused about, you know, what is a small cell and what is a CRAN, um, what is a DAS? Uh, so this is a bit of a reference for everyone. Um, when when I say small cell, what I'm talking about is a self-contained unit that includes its own baseband processing. Uh, and the benefit of that, of course, is low backhaul cost. Um, when you go to a remote radio head deployment in a centralized RAN configuration, uh, essentially, what you're doing there is putting the baseband processing in a central location. Uh, that increases the throughput requirement on the backhaul, uh, increases the cost of the backhaul, uh, but it gives you improved capacity and density in the network. Uh, so there's a trade-off there, and it's useful uh, for some applications. There is a movement now toward splitting up the baseband processing and partitioning differently uh, than the typical layer one, layer two, layer three, uh, so that you put some of the MAC and PHY baseband functions um, in the centralized uh, place and you put some of them in the radio head itself. Um, and that can give you the capacity and density benefits and reduce the cost of backhaul at the same time. Um, uh, outdoor DAS is something we'll be talking about quite a bit today. Um, usually this is a, a single operator deployment of remote radio heads. I mean, that, normally that's the way that outdoor DAS looks. Um, there are some examples, as, as Martha mentioned, of multi-carrier outdoor DAS, so uh, those are interesting cases. Um, and then finally, there are repeaters, which are which are one more option for coverage, uh, which really don't add capacity because it's it's just retransmitting the radio signal from the macro base station. Uh, but a repeater can be one of the least expensive options out there. Okay, great. So with that, why don't we move on, then, Martha? Yeah, thank you. That is a great overview. We really appreciate that. So at this time, we're going to move on to Jake Hamilton from Verizon, and Jake is going to focus his comments around CRAN. Jake. All right. Thanks, Martha. Uh, yeah. So, so um, Joe went into it a little bit about what CRAN is. Um, I'm going to talk about the topography and what it really means to us at Verizon and some of the new terminology that we're using. So CRAN really for us, centralized RAN, it is the key there is to have the baseband's um, centralized in what we call a hub location in today's, in today's world. And really what that allows us to do is to bring back many of the electronics that are remotely today or historically have been out at the uh, traditional macro sites or the cell sites in general. Now those all migrate back to the hub location and then we introduce a new terminology called front hall, which is really dark fiber between the hub and the macro sites or in building solutions or small cells. You know, it's really the goal is to have everything coming back to the hub so that processing is more centralized and you gain a lot of efficiencies, which we'll talk about that in our case study. But the key, the key differences between a traditional network and the CRAN topography is that hub and that front hall component. And with the dark fiber, we also introduce WDM equipment, which allows you to split the dark fiber into multiple colors, allowing you to support multiple radios, multiple sectors and frequencies at remote locations. Um, so it's a way to, for us to uh, optimize the, the cost structure for that as well. Um, and we can talk 
a little bit about what this means for San Francisco and how this benefited us in that deployment. So over the past year, we've been very aggressive at deploying CRAN node locations on streetlights within San Francisco. And we've, um, we've also converted several sites, macro sites and in-building solutions to also to the CRAN architecture so that we have that processing all centralized. And it's really providing a lot of benefits, but I'll first talk about the benefit we're seeing just in terms of the small cells or the nodes and, and what that's allowed for us to do. So with CRAN, we, we were able to remove the equipment, some of the electronics that would typically be at the remote locations, which allowed us to have a very slim design, as you can see in the pictures, really just a couple of radios and an antenna is all we were able um, to mount on the pole. And it really helped streamline the process with the city. And we got through zoning relatively quickly. Uh, if we would have had cabinets and other components, it, I think it would have been much more challenging for us. So it, it sped it up from a zoning perspective. And then also the installation uh, procedures at the remote locations was streamlined as well. There was really not a whole lot to configure there pretty much plug and play with the radios and the antennas and uh, all the integration and processing was done in the hub. So we were able to uh, gain a lot of efficiencies in the field with both the testing and uh, integration and installation. Um, but the real big benefits with CRAN is on the RF link. So now you, you have the centralized processing, all of the signaling coming back to the baseband units within the hub location those baseband's are now capable of being bridged together. And so multiple small cells, multiple macro sites can all start signaling and messaging across, um, and across each other and canceling or coordinating with their interference, uh, which really boosts your capacity and allows you to get much more um, capacity out of the spectrum that you have deployed. So we saw a lot of great benefits with the, the capacity and ahead of Super Bowl, we had a lot of traffic in downtown San Francisco in February and these small cells made a tremendous impact to our ability to support that network. Right, we saw we saw reports of, of the successful performance during the Super Bowl, so that's great. Okay, thank you very much, Jake. At this time, we're gonna hear from Ken Sanfeld, president of Solid Americas. Hi everyone. Um, so Solid is a uh, is a manufacturer of uh, DAS WDM optical products um, uh, for backhaul radios and repeaters and cell extenders. All things that we're going to be talking about uh, uh, today. Um, you know the the uh, the dense densification of the networks, the city cores is where um, all the action is. Right. That's where we need to increase capacity. And um, next slide, please. So uh, the drawing here shows a little example of, of how that uh, could work. It's similar to uh, uh, Jake's that in that um, the uh, you have fiber rings that are going to be more highly utilized WDM uh, type fiber rings that allow you to put more services and more types of capability um, in your network. So as you're going down the city street, the whole goal is that you might be serving an in-building system. Uh, you might be serving radio heads small cells, um, all different types of applications. You might be going to a central office location. Uh, you might be going to various central office locations. So the flexibility and the scalability of that network and how it can handle the head net is, is very, very key um, because the, dens the density is going to be so, uh, so high. So what we're focused on is, is really draining those solutions together into one cohesive uh, densification solution, uh, everything from the amplifiers, the optics, uh, the radios, and um, we will mention uh, repeater cell extenders. Um, they've been used to a very strong effect in other parts of the world, not, not as much here in the U.S., uh, but cell extenders also have a place in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, not capacity answer, but really coverage, right? It's more of a rural solution, but it also does play into things. Thank you. Okay, good. That's good. All right, thank you. And now we're going to hear from Todd Landry of JMA Wireless. Hey, Martha, thank you. And for those of you uh, who may be just hearing at JMA Wireless, we are 
or a manufacturer of the technology solutions in uh, very large scale venues. Uh, we're well known for enabling places like Levi Stadium for Super Bowl 50, among many uh, very large, uh, well known sports facilities, as well as uh, solutions that go into enterprises and public infrastructure as well, tunnels and, and outdoor metro areas. Now, uh, this slide talks a little bit about Levi Stadium in particular uh, because of the preparation. And, and you mentioned uh, Super Bowl a bit earlier. Uh, it represented an influx of a number of people. In the case of Levi Stadium, there's a significant number of sectors built around that stadium. In this case, 78 sectors uh, that are driven off a multi-carrier solution uh, for the Super Bowl. Now, uh, this image here in particular highlights how you can utilize a neutral host system where the um, CRAN component that uh, was mentioned earlier is really centralized in an area within the stadium because of the size of this facility, but then it's leveraged to service areas beyond just the stadium. Uh, so I kind of coined this as you've got uh, in the bowl, you've got tailgating. In the case of Super Bowl, you have neighbor gating. So uh, in the case of neighbor gating, what we've done in this uh, example is we've extended the system using fiber off of the in-venue uh, in DAS system to feed multi-carrier coverage and capacity to small cell areas surrounding the stadium. Uh, these include areas like you see on the image here. They also include areas in some of the uh, downtown uh, uh, Santa Clara area where there's a large population of people before and after the Super Bowl. Uh, so the other point of this is ways we can use a technology called CDAS to extend its capability uh, using optimizing the amount of fiber you need to extend that system out to remote sites. Now, Part of the issue in, in many cases is concealing uh, this uh, technology in a way that blends with the cityscape nicely. You can see an example here where with some of our partners, we fully integrated the radio technology into pole segments that can be assembled into a solution into the streetscape. And these poles are designed to uh, match with the characteristics needed for a cityscape. Uh, they can mount standard lighting on them, and they can have the JMA wireless antenna technology fully integrated at the top of it to make sure that we provide different beams of cellular signal, either up and down a street or in an omnidirectional pattern, as an example. That's great. Next. I think it's on more. So, uh, we mentioned earlier that the case studies surrounding Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and uh, in this case, if we look at Indianapolis Motor Speedway, it has some unique challenges. Uh, one is that during the course of their largest event, the Indy 500, it hosts more than 400,000 people, so extreme density in a very small area. Yet, the majority of the area and where people are is really an outdoor area, so this is uh, an event that in a small amount of time, just on a single carrier, in this case Verizon, there was nine terabytes of data exchange during that event of the people just in that particular area. So a lot of, uh, and we, you mentioned earlier, the need for uh, shifting the power levels down because of capacity versus coverage type demands. Now, you'll see in the images here, what was deployed as on-site or central RAN uh, components, these all feed into uh, a DAS head end. The DAS head end in this case was designed for this venue uh, to deliver 59 MIMO sectors around the raceway. Uh, this includes 142 individual remotes uh, in 71 locations to create smaller manageable cell locations. Uh, these, of course, feed into antennas, and we deployed some 300 antennas around the location uh, to be able to fulfill this. Now, the important point raised by Joe earlier was optimizing capacity. So in this example, we did not use high-power amplifiers. These are fairly low-power amplifiers and MIMO configuration and small sectors that allow us to optimize the performance uh, to each of the users. Thus, what you see here is a very highly distributed low power remote unit scenario. 
Okay, terrific. Thank you very much. Anything else, Todd? Okay. All, right. The... All right, terrific. Go ahead. We'll hear from you more later. We're going to jump into our discussion now. And our first topic is going to be um, outdoor public venues, just what you were talking about. Um, Jake, I'd like to start with you, though. We hear a lot about, about DAS upgrades at the, the top tier venues. And I think a lot of those venues have already upgraded their distributed antenna systems. So I'm wondering if you think that the cycle is nearing conclusion or will we see more DAS upgrades in the months ahead? Uh, yeah, thanks, Martha. Um, honestly, I think this is going to be an ongoing upgrade process um, until traffic stops growing, um, which we don't really see that happening. Um, you know, the challenge we see is as that traffic continues to grow, we have to continue to look at enhancements to, you know, we're doing it on the existing macro network, but we also have to do it in our venue locations as well. So a lot of the upgrades include, you know, converting existing frequencies that were used for earlier technologies, um, such as HSPA or 3G in our, in our case, uh, EVDO, and converting that to L LTE capable technology. So some of that stuff doesn't necessarily require DAS upgrades, uh, and some of it does. And then additionally, we look at adding a, additional zones or sectors to the stadiums to also split the traffic if, you know, as the traffic continues to grow. So we're doing a little bit of all of that. And then if you look into the future with just existing or, or new spectrum that's being purchased, you know, with AWS3 and other spectrum that's being auctioned, I really see, I don't see upgrades or DAS systems going away anytime soon. That's good news, that's good news. Okay, how do carriers measure the return on investment of a public venue DAS? Ken, do you have a perspective on that? Hmm. That's a very interesting question. So, you know, normally, I mean, obviously we're talking about how many user, you know, how many phones, um, how much data we're gonna consume in, in a particular venue. And the problem is that with most venues, they're not occupied 24 seven. So it's not like a macro site where you put it out there and you know you're going to hit a certain amount of population. You're only going to hit the amount of people that are going to be in there for those given amounts uh, of the year, those given days of the year. So it's very difficult to, to rationalize. What we see happening more often than not is there's really more uh, political pressures or pressures from the public to the venue owner or even the venue owner basically saying, look, you know, are you, the, you, the, uh, the public's not happy with um, the service in the facility. And usually that's an executive to an executive call. But I mean, ultimately, you know, there's everyone has their own formulas and calculators for figuring out, you know, how many users, you know, in the building, how many days per year, uh, how does that translate into, you know, into an ROI? The problem is, is that it, it may not even pencil out properly for the ROI, but <laughs> the operators usually don't necessarily have, um, you know, a choice because uh, the public is, is crying out, right? So. Um, that's typically the case. Um, can let me uh, to the macro. Go ahead. If I can, if I can step in here, it's Joe Madden. We we've just published some forecasts uh, and analysis, really, that look at this question of ROI from the point of view of the operator and also from the point of view of the venue owner. And uh, and we've done that for eight different vertical markets. Uh, the stadium or outdoor venue is just one of those cases. Uh, but but what I would say in general is that it, for for a lot of different enterprises, uh, there's a better ROI for the building owner themselves to invest in in a DAS uh, than for the operator. Uh, you take a case like this Indianapolis uh, Motor Speedway, uh, they have a few big events a year, and there's not enough traffic on those few events for just a few hours uh, to pay for the system from an operator's point of view. Uh, but it's really actually critical for the venue owner itself uh, to, to have happy customers. And so uh, in, in some of our analysis, what we find is that there's, there's more revenue on the line for the building owner than there is for the operator in many, many uh, enterprise cases. And do you see some of those building owners stepping up to, to invest in those systems? Uh, yes, increasingly they are. In fact, we've we've noticed that uh, enterprise spending on this kind of equipment has tripled over the last two years. Uh, so that's probably the fastest growing part of of small cell deployment. That's excellent, Martha. I'd, I'd add to that. You know, Joe's uh, Joe's writing what he's seen. If you get into some of the stadiums, if you take uh, the, the Levi Stadium as an example, you know they now host their own app 
applications which drive a lot of business. Uh, if you look at some of the statistics of the revenue, the additional revenue generated uh, on every aspect of their retail uh, activities during an event, it's very important for them to keep their people connected. If you look at the usage during an event like a Super Bowl alone, combined Wi-Fi and wireless with some 26 terabytes of traffic during a roughly a three to four hour event in that stadium. Uh, very important, not only for the venue, but uh, I think let's all keep in mind the carriers, you know, get paid on ARPU and they don't like churn and therefore having a good experience for users that are in high profile events are very important for those carriers. Okay, great. Now, Todd, you mentioned that the stadium having its own apps and that that generates revenue. So we are going to come back to these other questions, but I want to just quickly jump down to the bottom question about Wi-Fi because that is probably something that the stadium would would use for its apps. So is it is it possible to integrate a carrier DAS or small cell system with a stadium's existing Wi-Fi? Todd? Well, yeah, thanks. This is a common question, of course, and uh, in almost every venue we're in, we see a combination of DAS and Wi-Fi systems. Uh, Super Bowl day, uh, I mentioned 26 terabytes. 16 of that was on the cellular side. The remaining was on Wi-Fi. So a significant part on cellular in that kind of venue. Now, integrating these things, the, the, I think a couple important things to understand. If the solutions are deployed simultaneously, the infrastructure can be pulled, fiber, uh, power, et cetera, to certain uh, points around the stadium that are IDFs or, or technical rooms that would then distribute antennas or access points. However, uh, often the question I get is, well, why isn't Wi-Fi just built into the same antennas? These are very different uh, RF planning scenarios we have to deal with within venues. So you'll see access points placed in different locations than you will see cellular. There is a certain level of integration, but at the radio side, there still has to be a slightly different radio plan, unfortunately. Okay, that's good information. Okay, let's get back to testing. I can only imagine the testing that has to go on before an event like the Indianapolis 500 or the Super Bowl. Jake, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll talk specifically about Super Bowl 50. Um, I was highly involved in the activities there. We um, we did a massive upgrade. You know, after one year on a brand new stadium, we almost doubled the number of sectors we had in the in and around the stadium. Um, and all of those upgrades required, you know, basically re-optimization of the system. And we had, you know, a limited number of home games up uh, up to the Super Bowl that we could we could work with. So what it really looks like from a field perspective is a lot of walk testing, a lot of walk testing ahead of the games just to make sure you're seeing the right signals coming out of the antennas. You don't see a lot of overlap between the sectors, um, making sure the system is clean from a, from a noise perspective. So we, uh, we had to tighten up a lot of cabling and make sure everything is really, uh, really tightened down and, and clean. And then also we had to look at adjustments to the surrounding sites because, you know, Levi's being outdoors, you get a lot of noise bleed in from the existing network outside the stadium. So we had a whole shutdown plan that, that would happen before the game or as people started coming into the stadium. Um, so that was well documented and understood of what had to happen. We also pulled in cows uh, specifically for Super Bowl 50. So that added a, another element of, of kind of a late optimization surprise that we had to deal with. But um, really, it's the home game. It's when the crowds get into the stadium that you can really see how your system is going to um, perform. And so during every home game, we had people walking around the stadium, measuring uh, performance, making sure they're seeing, you know, um, or minimizing amount of noise that they see in one sector from, you know, another sector. And we had command center that was going, watching stats real time and making power level adjustments and parameter changes to the system to make sure we were optimized as best as we could be for, you know, an event like Super Bowl 50. And then I guess you, you learn a lot during the event as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah. We were making real time adjustments throughout the Super Bowl as well. <laughs> so, okay. You know, it, you know Martha, to, just to add color to that, uh, we had the JMA RF team uh, on site. Uh, well, I should say close by. We had 
at a command center about five miles away monitoring things live. Uh, and in that system, we had our spectrum analyzers monitoring all the sectors. In coordination with uh, folks at Verizon, for example, we were able to uh, observe the performance and adjust the noise floor down across the sectors during the event. And as a result of that, we were able to actually increase the performance that users were experiencing in the stadium, even though they didn't know it was taking place and it was all being optimized from about five miles away. Wow, that's interesting. All right, Ken, do you see more carrier-led or neutral host DAS projects in venues now? Uh, we're seeing more and more uh, neutral host uh, third-party owner solutions uh, uh, coming up. The increasingly the operators want to do what they do best, which is supply service. Um, and it's not necessarily uh, cheaper uh, for them. However, from an accounting perspective, it's easy to to make an OPEX um, situation work than it is for an operator to invest in the whole uh, in the whole system. Either way, it's a big investment, right? And um, but we're seeing more and more as we're talking about. I mean, not every project is a stadium. Right there's more there's more traditional buildings uh, to deploy than there are stadiums, and so uh, solving for those is really being done uh, in a bit to a big extent by a lot of third party owners, and of course, like we've already talked about on the call here, the enterprises are paying for more and more of their systems, and um, and so what's happening there is the uh, then it comes down to you know how much of the capital equipment is gonna be paid by the operator, how much is gonna be paid for by the building owner. And to that extent, most of it's being paid for by the building owner. So then the only thing left to solve for is uh, signal sourcing. And that's where the, the biggest changes are happening over the next few years. So um, yeah, we see mostly, um, most of the projects now are coming up as third party uh, funded and managed. Um, but all the stakeholders are able to you know, make a, um, a big push to the, what their needs are. And so it's a much more favorable environment than it was years, many years ago. That's good. But even when a third party funds it, isn't it often one primary carrier that's the anchor tenant to start with? Well, you know, that's the way it was and that's the way it has been in the past, especially on the very expensive system. But, you know, ultimately that's not good for, that's not good for the users, right? I mean, uh, you know, and, and, and there's certainly on the bigger project, the bigger venues, that can happen, but ultimately the, the goal is for multiple operators to be on the system and for it to be operationalized so that, that everyone can play Absolutely. and the building owner, you know, I mean, that is really the goal here. Um, in building can't be a land grab because the users in the building are typically transient. Uh, if you think about a hospital or a hotel, no one knows who's gonna be coming through there. So it doesn't serve anyone well. Um, by land grabbing that. And so that's ultimately something that this industry has to solve for, and I think is solving for that right now. Okay, great. Now getting back to the outdoor, Todd, do you see more multi-carrier solutions also? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think uh, the observations are correct here. Um, we, and, and whether you're looking at enterprises or outdoor venues, uh, the reality is if we, if we go to the, the end user community there, there's a blend, there's a mixture of different carrier mobile devices there, and they're looking for ways to have connectivity across all of them. Uh, we work with a number of enterprises who are moving towards this uh, investment to put this in their facilities, and they want to go to a solution that allows them, particularly in environments like uh, uh, tenant buildings, it's become the baseline of, of uh, of requirements along with water and electricity and therefore the building owners are looking at it and saying for me to attract tenants I have to be able to address their needs which means I have to address multi-carrier so we're seeing that now uh, we have introduced this year or started to roll out what we refer to as more of an EDAS solution uh, centered on using uh, the DAS platform but optimized to use uh, small cell-like RF sources to feed it, making it easier to deploy while still delivering the capacity that you need for a building. And this is kind of kind of breaking through some of that issue of how do I get this, this RF sourcing into these facilities. But indeed, uh, a lot of demand for multiple carriers, thus it, it leads to
towards a, a neutral host solution as an optimum solution for that. Okay, so EDES is a solution you're talking about for indoor, and now you're, for outdoor, you've got CDES, right? And That's you're right. So for there, C, right? And, and CDES, what CDES really does is it leverages uh, the CRAN, uh, and it can leverage the CRAN locations of different carriers. So when I have in a region, uh, I'll give you an ex there's examples uh, in California where we're working on deploying capacity across the bridges. Well, it's efficient for us to have a small footprint head end at one side of the bridge and be able to deliver capacity, right, remotes and antennas across that bridge. From the small footprint head end, we can go out to mobile switching centers of the different carriers and get the local uh, RF sources there and bring them over a very small amount of fiber to our small footprint head end and then combine all those at that small footprint head end. So it's a very efficient way, meaning it reduces the amount of fiber you need to the CRAN by as much as 10 times uh, what a traditional RRH approach would, would uh, take. Uh, and then it has the added value of being able to source RF from different physical locations into the venue of choice. Okay, that's a good concrete example. Okay, great. Let's move on and talk about some of these dense urban areas that are the real hot spots, I think, for, for small cell deployments. Now, city governments in most major metro areas have a lot of say over what gets deployed and who gets to deploy it and where they get to attach or build. So, Jake, what are you finding with the, the different city governments that you work with? Well, I would say, you know, at a high level or in general, the city governments are supportive of the concept of a small cell or a DAS solution. Um, but, but the challenge is much more complex than, than that. It's the level of support that really um, varies drastically among the agencies or the, or the cities. And what we see is that, you know, some, for example, will expedite permitting to allow or quicker speed the market um, for small cells. Um, while others have a, a longer, more difficult process to get through, which takes a longer to deploy. Um, I would say the more challenging piece we have is for those assets that are owned by the city, and that's generally in some of the core downtown areas where you have to get agreements with the cities to attach to their existing infrastructure. That's where sometimes we hit roadblocks and we have to really try to figure out who the right person is within the government to influence, um, to make sure that they understand why it's needed and you know the growth behind it and how it's gonna influence the city and the economic benefits in the future. Um, and once, once we kind of bridge that gap, that knowledge gap, then the local level staff who, who typically gets assigned these projects to work with, you know, as a side project, will um, start supporting it and we'll see more movement. But really just that it really varies city by city on how um, motivated they are to move forward with agreements. Um, and then the permitting aspects um, will flow beyond that. So there are some cities that just say no. And, you know, we walk away, we look for alternative solutions. But at the same time, we're still looking for opportunities to connect with the right people within those cities. And is it usually uh, within within the city council or, or um, parts of that, or do you have to go to other local authorities that um, that are outside the elected officials? Um, well, it's usually within the elected officials. There are um, you know there are the agencies that own the assets that we have to connect with that aren't always elected, um, but ultimately they roll up to you know the mayor, for example. And sometimes we have to go to the mayor and get their support. Um, but that's the extreme case. For, for the most part, we can get some movement by just working within you know, existing agencies, but you just have to go to sometimes the top of those agencies to make sure it's, uh, it's supported. Are you concerned that cities aren't prepared to support the volume that is coming? I am concerned, yeah. They're, um, that's probably one of our biggest challenges is, you know, I don't feel like the, the cities necessarily don't support the small cells, but I think it's just a distraction that they have on their day-to-day -day jobs that um, because they're, they don't have dedicated resources to support 
support, for the, at least from what I can tell, cities don't have dedicated resources that will support uh, a project for the wireless carriers, for example. And, um, and so we see things getting bogged down, especially with the volume. Small cell nodes, I mean, there's much more volumes that you would typically see in, um, in an area or in a city. So the permit process really has to be streamlined for that to be efficient for not only them, but for us um, so that we can deploy quicker and uh, without a lot of hassle on, the, on their part um, and bogging them down with a, a bunch of red tape. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Well, let's talk a little bit about the network architectures. Um, Ken, what do you see as the advantages of distributed antennas versus small cells or remote radio units? Absolutely. Well, you know, that's been a that's been a, a big conversation piece at all the conferences for several years now, right? <laughs> uh, but you know what? I'd like to break it up into two parts. It's really simple. Jake kind of hit on it earlier, right? The goal is to get the centralized processing to happen at a point where it's easily accessible, it's easy to upgrade, and the electronics, the systems, the you know, the the core network can command the data pass properly and more efficiently make decisions about handoffs more, you know, and more efficiently. And also, most importantly, to remove more electronics from the pole uh, to a centralized point. You know, with that said, um, you know, the small cells today uh, compared to a, a, an equivalent high performance latest generation uh, DAS node, the DAS node is, is clearly um, multiple operator and it's full bandwidth, right? The small cells, even though they're getting better every day, are typically a little bit less bandwidth, and they're typically not multi-operated. Now, that's that's going to continue to evolve. Um, so, so you're dealing with some size issues, difference the size differences. Um, you're dealing with the fact that right now it's much easier, uh, based on the current models, for an operator to go into a city and say, "I'd like to put up, you know, this little little tiny box on the pole, and guess what? I'm going to improve my coverage," and that's great. But the part the part that needs to be discussed is the cities don't know what they don't know, right? So how many poles do they have? Is that city capable of hosting all, all operators on all the poles they have if everyone gets their own pole? You know, so that's kind of, um, that's kind of the, big, the bigger discussion, right? But from an electronic standpoint, they each have their pluses and minuses and they each have their different applications. Okay, okay, great. And what about um, those, the, you said they only have so many poles. Is there room for everybody or do you think that the first carriers to get a position are, are gonna have an advantage for many, many years going forward? Well, I don't know how long those advantages, you know, will, will be. Um, you know, if, if, uh, if everyone land grabs, um, then, then what happens when there's an area where there is no more poles? You know, then that all of a sudden becomes, a, I think it's gonna go similar to, to macro where colo becomes something that's common. I think the technology is gonna make it so, and I think the cities are gonna start requiring. The cities are educating themselves now, and they're gonna to want to do more on a poll. So they're gonna they're going to push back and say, is there a way that we can get, you know, two, three, or four guys on a poll? And how does that make sense, right? And, and oh, by the way, it has to be really tiny, and I don't wanna to have to see it, and all that good stuff, right? So the, the technology obviously has to be there, but it's, uh, you know that that's really what I think is going to happen. Is it's the, uh, the 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 market's going to grow up? Uh, there's only so many poles. There's all, only so many street corners in order to cover those streets. So uh, it's a finite resource. Yep. Well, and Ken, you you make you make a key point. A lot of these organizations, city government enterprises, are educating themselves, and many us as vendors are educating them on the pros cons of of these different approaches. They know their audience needs to have support for multiple carriers. They know that they only have so much footprint and they wanna optimize uh, what they can do within that footprint to deliver. Uh, we know when we look at uh, an outdoor facility that the ratio of equipment that you need to put in a given area is a significantly different in a uh, uh, traditional IRH approach versus the DAS approach. So there's certainly these pros and cons to play now. Add to that the fact of what we talked about before, where we're, we're seeing uh, the end user or end community start to look at how they're going to own or fund some of these assets. They're going to make smarter decisions when they start writing the checks, and they're going to start pushing demands for a solution that can optimize space, optimize what they can deliver into that environment. Well, centralized RAN 
is a solution that I think can can optimize space. Joe, do you think that we're going to see more and more of those going forward? Absolutely. I think uh, centralizing the baseband gives you the opportunity to, to put headroom in the system. Uh, you know, the, the operators are facing ongoing growth. And if they have, you know, if they have long term plans for, for this uh, traffic growth growing 50, 60 percent every year, uh, they have to put an architecture in place where they don't have to dig up the street every year to put in uh, new fibers or something like this. So, so I think centralizing the baseband, uh, putting a fiber in place to a radio head on a pole is a much better way to do that. You can then upgrade the box on the pole. Uh, you can upgrade the, the equipment in the hub and, and make everything work better and, and increase your capacity in the future without going back for new permits uh, and changing everything. Uh, so I, I do think it'll be more common. I mean, it's already fairly common in some places. Um, you know, we're at a point where we have tens of thousands of centralized radio heads. Uh, well, cent radio heads that are attached to centralized baseband processing. Um, in Korea and in Japan, that's very, very common. And uh, it's becoming more common now in the U.S. So uh, you know, th this is the way of the future. Okay. All right. Great. Well, Jake, you're, uh, you're doing this day in and day out. Do you plan more CRAN type deployments? Yeah, we do. We have uh, actually quite a quite a bit going on, and we are very active looking at um, how to densify our network in the majority of our major metro um, dense urban environments, and also looking at how we bridge the existing cell sites um, to those CRANs as well, so that we can benefit from the RF enhancements that are coming. Um, not only with LTE, but in the future with 5G. Right. So, so tell us how these deployments can possibly impact 5G, given that we don't exactly know yet what 5G really is. Yeah. Okay. So yesterday, I actually listened to a um, a small cell workshop that was hosted by the FCC, and the uh, FCC commissioner Tom Wheeler mentioned several times that 5G really is a three-legged stool. Um, you need spectrum, you need more antennas, and you need greater backhaul. Um, and he also made the comment that if we can site a 5G uh, cell site, we can be the world leaders in 5G. So what that really means to me is what we are doing today with small cells is we are defining, you know, the more antenna component of that three-legged stool. Um, we're really identifying our network and we're building out the fiber with the centralized RAN architecture to where backhaul is going to be there when we need it for 5G. Um, so we're, we're basically building the foundation of 5G with our small cell CRAN deployments in today's environment. Okay, well, that's, let's hope that that works out because I know that everybody's really interested to learn more and more about the specifics of 5G. So that's, that's exciting. Now, before we move on, I wanted to mention that we've had a lot of good audience questions. A couple of these are, are too complex to answer on, on this webinar, and we're also tight on time. So we will try to get back to those questions uh, one, one by one later in the week. Um, a couple that we can address right now. One person asked if the um, Verizon CRAN deployment included small cells. Um, I think Jake can answer that, but but it does, and, and there's quite a bit written about that already on the RSR wireless website and also in the report that I mentioned earlier. And another uh, question was about uh, a report about DAS and venues. So uh, again, check out the report on our website and see if that hopefully answers your question, and then if, if not, let us hear from you. Okay, so moving on, our last topic is suburban and rural deployments. Obviously, um, these small cells and DAS can make a huge difference to people who might not otherwise have cellular coverage. So let's start off by finding out what makes an area a good candidate for DAS or small cells. Ken? The, um, the, the good candidates for um, uh, the good candidates for DAS or small cell is really manufacturers, right? So your connectivity, Jake kind of mentioned it, right? You, know, the, you have your three-legged stool. It kind of applies here too, right? So your connectivity type uh, is a fiber line of sight, non-line of sight. Um, your site, uh, what can it handle different types of uh, weight, space, uh, constraints? Um, you know, in, in this case, I think also the number of operators that can play on that pole is, is a big consideration um, in those environments. And let's not, let's not forget that in addition to the traditional solutions that we're talking about today, which are typically the small cell radio heads, staff, you know, in other parts, 
for the world uh, cell extenders are used to a, a big extent as well, especially if there's any type of uh, geographical definition to the area that's not getting coverage um, because it's a blockage a mountain or a hill or a building. And so, you know, there's there's different things that, that uh, you know, impact the selection. Um, but those are some of the those are some of the few uh, that that have a, that can have an impact. Okay, great. And Joe, what are the most common network architectures in your experience? Well, you know, up, up until this point of the webinar, we've been talking about the urban case, where it's really all about capacity, and and deploying something in an urban corridor is is really. Uh, the intent is to put the antenna fairly low and at very low power so that you're not interfering with the network around. Uh, when we start talking about these more rural deployments, now you're talking about coverage again. And uh, frankly speaking, you know, the, the macro network in these areas has, in many cases, excess capacity today. Uh, what we're what we're doing in terms of uh, outdoor DAS deployments or small cell deployments in, in the uh, less populated areas is filling in those coverage holes. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, the, the most common way of doing, doing that in the past has been uh, what they call outdoor DAS, and, and essentially that has become a, a, a code word for saying that we're deploying radio heads uh, for individual operators in the U.S. market, uh, and uh, the, there are third-party companies, uh, the system integrators, that deploy those on behalf of the operators. Um, increasingly, in the last two years, we've started to see uh, outdoor small cells being deployed, uh, where the baseband processing is is included there, and uh, as Ken mentioned, the, the there the connectivity becomes very important. Um, you know, there are many cases where those those units sit on a, a, a cable strand or maybe sit on a, a twisted pair uh, copper line. Um, as you get into the, the the suburban areas, instead of rural, maybe you'll you'll go to fiber, so you have a little additional capacity. Um, but I, I think in, in these cases, we're not really thinking so much about capacity, so we can live with something like a, a single band small cell um, with uh, maybe only 100 megabits per second, and that, that could live uh, on top of a cable strand. Okay, so that, that's the, the backhaul source for the rural deployments is typically cable? Could be, yeah, it could be that, or it could be the, the, the local loop uh, of twisted pair uh, copper. Okay, all right, great. And Jay, Martha, let's, yeah. Martha, let's remember that uh, traditionally those solutions are really more for the voice side, especially more right. and more as people have their own home broadband. Yeah. So when they get home, they're, they're connecting to Wi-Fi, right? So it really is so that they can make an emergency call or they can make phone calls in general. Good point. Okay, Jake, do people who live near small cells have questions about how their health could be impacted? Yeah, they absolutely do. Um, so very similar to what we've seen on macro sites, you have the same concerns from the public on small cells as well. Um, so, you know, our, our goal is really just to educate the, um, the citizens and make sure they understand what the FCC requirements are and their guidelines regarding RF admissions and how we, how we um, uh, are within those, those ranges. Um, and we just make sure that they understand like each location we we produce calculations to to ensure that we're within the set guidelines and even on small cells you know we educate to show you know what the difference between small cells and macros are in terms of overall aggregate power and because they're much lower we see that they're typically well below what we see from a traditional macro site um, and then also there's some jurisdictions that actually require us to go through their, their health departments for review and approval of our admissions reports. And uh, in some scenarios, we have offered pre and post RF measurements to concerned citizens. So we just try to uh, overall educate them and give them some, some comfort level around what we're deploying. Okay. Okay, great. And then um, what about working with, with private landowners? I know that that goes on a lot on the macro side. Do you do that a lot for small cells as well? Yeah, we do. We, um, you know, we have what we call also within Verizon, you know, or within our sub-market, we call them medium cells. So we have a blend going on in the industry also between a traditional macro site and a small cell on a pole. Um, so there are many examples that we have where we've gone to a private landlord and just requested, you know, a small access space for a cabinet, a single radio, and an antenna. Um, so we do that quite a bit. And, you know, traditionally those have been called microcells in the past. Really, 
physically, they don't look much different, um, but we do use a centralized RAN architecture for those. Um, so, you know, we work a lot of different solutions. We try not to, you know, um, force ourselves down a path. We, um, we really open ourselves up to be creative. Um, and where we usually use those is are in scenarios where the public right away has challenges. And we've seen cases where, you know, a certain street may have decorative poles that we just, we are having challenges with the local um, government to find a solution that works for both uh, both us and for the, the local um, zoning uh, administrators. So, so we look at private property owners on, in those scenarios. So it does happen. And, and what about the situations you mentioned earlier where the city's not very cooperative? Would you also work with private landowners then? Yeah, in a scenario where, you know, city just doesn't want to um, work with us on a small cell agreement for their city assets, all, our ter alternative is to work with private landlords. And, um, you know, it doesn't work well in terms of volume because you're in the, you're doing unique designs, usually per location, and you're negotiating a lease individually versus a, usually a master lease with one entity that you can somewhat streamline once you get that work through. So it's not the great it's not a great model, but it, it uh, we do use it when we need to. Okay, all right, great. And we are running short on time, but uh, concealment I guess that's um, often an objective in some of the suburban type neighborhoods, right? Yeah, absolutely. Aesthetics is probably one of our number one concerns for small mm -hmm. cells. Um, I mean, we've seen it and we've dealt with it on the macro side as well. But there um, and it's not only in the the neighborhoods, but it's also um, in some of the, you know, mixed urban use areas as well. So we do spend a lot of time during the design phase of a small cell deployment with the cities to make sure that we um, we can agree to a design that works for them. And a lot of times it does require some sort of stealthing. Right. So, for example, in San Jose, you know, we've, we've worked with, um, with Phillips on an integrated street light um, in San Jose. So all of our equipment is with, within the pole itself. Um, and, you know, that works well for San Jose. In Palo Alto, we're working with them on a solution that has a faux um, post office box in the sidewalk where we were putting our equipment. So, you know, we look at a lot of different options. An another creative solution was in San Francisco, you know, specifically on Market Street where we used existing outdoor street furniture to hide our equipment. Oh, so anytime we can successfully conceal our equipment, um, we look for those uh, options just because it does make the zoning process and the permitting process go quicker. Yeah, that's really interesting. Okay, great. Well, we are about out of time. I want to quickly ask Joe to address one question that's come in from more than one audience member. People are asking about MOCN and the neutral host model. Joe, can you address that quickly before we close? Joe? Sorry, I'm, I, I had a little bit background noise. I was on mute there. Oh, okay. um, yeah, so a, a multi-operated core networks. That's a that's a very common discussion these days. But in fact, uh, I have not seen a lot of uh, action with mobile operators on this. Um, it from a technology point of view, it makes a lot of sense to uh, to share the radio resources and then to have two separate. Uh, MME elements which connect to the the radio resource and and uh, to to have the the user device going through the channel that's appropriate for the core network it's connecting to. Uh, I think the technology would work, uh, but uh, mobile operators, in, in my experience, uh, talking with uh, dozens of operators around the world, uh, in general, they're not they're they're not willing to share these kind of elements. So uh, if one operator is depending on uh, a radio that's uh, deployed by another operator. That uh, that it has, uh, for example, software to be upgraded. Uh, they they don't want to be surprised late one night when the other operator makes a software upgrade and and leaves them hanging with some change in the network. Um, and uh, so, you know, in my experience, especially in the larger markets in Europe and the U.S. Uh, in in the uh, large Asian markets, uh, this kind of sharing is really just not um, not something they want to do. Okay, thank you very much. All right, well, we are out of time. So at this time, I'd like to, to thank all of our panelists. It's been a great webinar. Jake Hamilton, Verizon Wireless, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Joe Thanks, Madden, Martha. Have a great day. thank you very much. It's always great to have you on the webinars. Ken Sanfeld, President.
president of Solid Americas. Ken, thank you very much for being here. Thanks for having us. And Todd Landry of JMA Wireless. Todd, thank you very much for your insights today. Martha, thank you so much. And I'm Martha DeGrasse with RCR Wireless News, and this will conclude the webinar.